Hey everyone. So we have our 3 p.m. catechesis. I'm going to state out front again that I'm going to try to do this in about half an hour, 40 minutes. Last time yesterday I said that and it turned out to be a whole hour. So I'd <clears throat> so let's get right to it. First, I so I got a couple of questions, which is great. I'm going to get to those in just a second. First, I wanted to do a programming note uh, or anticipate a question that you might think of it. If you have your prayer book, um, grab it. If you don't, that's okay. Um, just if you're able to write down or remember page 997, 997. And the, the reason I'm giving you that page in your prayer book is because it, it throws a wrinkle into the discussion and teaching I gave yesterday about daily office lectionary. There are, so the daily office lectionary is, as I said, but then after you get through the end of that, it enters another portion of the daily office lectionary, which is the lectionary for holy days. And on page 997, you see that there are holy days listed along with page 996. Particularly tomorrow, you'll notice, is being March 25th, and I've mentioned this before, is the Feast of the Annunciation. And we will be using those uh, lessons tomorrow for morning prayer and evening prayer. But look above that. It says Eve of the Annunciation. That is to say, tonight, evening prayer, Eve of the Annunciation, the evening before, just like Christmas Eve is the evening before Christmas Day, Eve of the Annunciation has lessons as well, Genesis, and then the choice of either Romans or Galatians, as you see. And so we will, we will do those, and I... And I don't know exactly right now which between Romans or Galatians we will we will do, but we'll do one of them. And um, and if we were following the uh, the, the seven week Psalter cycle, you see also that uh, Psalm eight and Psalm one thirty eight uh, would be appointed according to that cycle. But uh, I, I we've been doing the thirty day cycle, so we will just do the uh, psalms for the 24th day evening prayer this evening. That's what I prefer to do all year long. Always say the psalms according to the day, morning or evening, because again, it's such a rich way because then the liturgical calendar gets in the meaning. So for example, of uh, Mary receiving the Annunciation or experiencing the Annunciation from Gabriel, can then infuse into Psalms for the 24th day and the 25th day, which is interesting. And that's the 24th day, as I mentioned this morning, starting this evening is when we start to get into Psalm 119. And we'll spend a couple of days going through all of Psalm 119 because it's over 140, over 150 verses. And um, to then allow the, the fact that we're celebrating the Annunciation then to color how uh, our reading of the Psalms. And maybe there are connections and correspondences between the, uh, the angel of the Lord announcing to Mary and verses from the Psalms that we'll be reading over the next, well, the evening prayer tonight and then morning prayer and evening prayer tomorrow. Anyway, so, there are times throughout the calendar and when there are specific readings according to the calendar, holy days. And you see it actually goes all the way to page uh, 1000 for all of the holy days. And then there's even appointed daily office lectionary for other special occasions, eve of dedication of a church, anniversary of the dedication of a church, and then Eve, as well as Feast of the Patronal Feast, for so far in our case, it would be Eve of All Saints for the Patronal Feast of All Saints Church, and Eve of the Conversion of St. Paul for the Patronal Feast of St. Paul's here at Beacon. 
And then also any time that there is a feast of an apostle or an evangelist, the last one, um, you know, St. Peter, St. Bartholomew, St. Andrew, and all the rest, there are appointed lessons for the eve of those feasts, the, the evening before. Okay, so that's, that's a bit on the mechanics of the daily office. Okay, so one of the questions I got from, uh, from you all, from, from Peggy, was sh she wanted me to talk about the experience I had as a, I think I was five years old, and I mentioned yesterday that that was, however old I was, I might have been four or five or six, I, I don't know, something along, something in that area. I point to now as the time that God called me. And so I want to say a little bit more about that. Let me set the stage. I was at my father's parents' house, that is to say, my paternal grandmother and grandfather's house, and that uh, they are both dead and um, in the church expectant, um, Grandma Gert and Grandpa Roy, and here I have to point out that my Grandma Gert's full name was Gertrude Hildegard Zook, that was her maiden name, Dolman. Gertrude Hildegard Zook Dolman. And Ger uh, Grandma Gertrude uh, figures in to this story. So we were, we, I was at their house and we lived about, you know, two and, a half, two, two and a half hours south in Milwaukee. So we would often go up to where they lived. And they lived near Green Bay, Wisconsin in a town called Shawano. S-H-A-W-A-N-O, Shawano. Looks like Shawano. And that's where my uh, dad was born and grew up. And we would, so we were visiting them one time. I don't know when it was. And I, well, and this might be a composite memory. That is to say several of these occasions put together. I, I always remembered this. And what, what it was is, let me, let me say it this way. When I started to feel called to the priesthood back up in St. Paul's Riverside, our former church, our former parish outside of Chicago, um, my priest, my rector, Father Thomas Frazier, who is my mentor, asked me the earliest moment that I can identify as a presence of God in my life. And I had never... I never thought about that question. I never thought about that question, despite the fact that I grew up going to church every Sunday, a Lutheran church, the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America, a fairly well-to-do uh, church in Fox Point, Wisconsin. It was called Fox Point Evangelical Lutheran Church. And... I did, I did some youth group stuff, although not a whole lot. I think I volunteered one or two years at the Vacation Bible School. Um, but um, I was in Sunday school. But anyway, so I, I never thought about uh, what, if God was ever present in my life. And so Father Frazier asking me, when can I, if, are there any moments in my life when I, can identify that God was present. So w without any prompt or without any thinking about it, or in fact, it was a complete surprise to me. I immediately thought of this moment, or it might have been a composite group of moments, when I was about four or five years old, back and visiting in Shawano, Wisconsin, my grandparents' house with my family, with my dad and my mom and my brother, Christopher. And the memory that came back was very specific. It was in the family room, or the living room. I don't know what the room was called. It's a room that had a big, huge window. And there were couches, carpeting, and a big fireplace, one of these old-fashioned fireplaces where you light the fire the way the, 
the way the architecture of the house is designed and all that, the heat is actually able to go up throughout all the rooms of the house. Stone, fireplace, beautiful. And, but also was my grandmother Gert's piano and her console organ. And the memory that came to mind immediately when I was asked by the first time that I could identify God's presence in my life was listening to my grandmother Gertrude play piano or organ. Sometimes I think of it as piano, sometimes I think of it as organ, which is why I say it might be a composite memory. And I can remember very, very palpably listening to her play and my hands, I was sitting on, on, on the carpeting. My hands were in the carpeting to support myself, but also I, I can remember the feel of the carpeting, the look of the carpeting. It had a very present sensory manifestation to me, the, car the carpeting, both in terms of touch and in look, maybe smell too, I'm not sure. And the feel of the carpeting as as I was just getting lost in my grandmother playing music on the piano or the organ. Her style of playing the piano and the organ, well, she was a, she was, she could play songs. She could, she could look at music, a, a hymn or, or some other piece of music and, and sight read it pretty well. But she usually didn't do that. Sometimes she sang, but usually she just sat at either the organ or the organ with the piano and just improvised. And it was of a very relaxed character her improvisation that I, I don't remember what she was playing obviously, but I remember the feeling that I had listening to it and the, the feeling I had getting lost in it and carried and transported in some sense, although transported, but at the same time really feeling the carpeting. So it, was, it, wasn't, it wasn't an out-of-body experience. It was just a, an experience of openness and vastness, but also presence. I was there. I wasn't daydreaming somewhere else, like, you know, in the Himalayas or, 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 or in, in, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't on a leaf in a river floating along. But I was right where I was, listening to my grandmother play, but yet at the same time, a sense of expansiveness, openness, largeness. I get very animated and, and descriptive when I, I've noticed when I tell this story. And again, maybe, I don't know how I am right now coming off, but I've been told many times in the past that whenever I start talking about this, I, I get very, my, my energy uh, level. They give off a lot of energy. So, yeah. So I carried that in my body and in my mind and in my soul, that experience with me. And I, and I remembered the experience growing up. In fact, I at one point attribute that experience, of the, 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 this beautiful experience of the beauty of music and just a beautiful vastness and imminent presence. I attribute having that experience as to what did drive me to music, which I, I did for a number of years in a variety of ways. I played piano, I played violin, I played alto saxophone, eventually took up guitar, learned guitar in terms of rock, in terms of jazz, in terms of classical. I learned composing in terms of variety of genres, classical and um, 16th century Italian Renaissance polyphony and jazz, both big band as well as jazz small group stuff. I did some chamber music compositions. I did some different kinds of things. Eventually, uh, I studied with a great couple of great musicians, um, both for guitar performance, piano, as, as well as composition. All of that, I think, came from the fact that I had had this experience listening to my grandmother Gertrude play the piano and the organ in her Shawano, Wisconsin residence on the carpeting in her family room fireplace. But I had never thought about it in any other way. But then when Father Fraser asked me about my first experience with the presence of God, I immediately thought of this. It was surprising for me to identify and make that connection, God and listening to my grandmother play. But it, 
surprising to me, but from the moment that he first asked me, I accepted it. And then as I've thought about it in the 10 years since then, many times, as, as I've told this story to many people, um, I believe it more and more and more and more. I believe truly that that was an experience of God's presence. Um, it was certainly a, a, an experience that I would use the term beautiful. There was a goodness about it because it was my grandmother playing and my grandmother's sort of living into her best self. She was definitely my, my model for the music. Truth, too. There's something very true about music purely performed and experienced. So, you know, all three, beauty, truth, and goodness. And as I've said, everything that's good in this world, everything that's beautiful in this world, and everything that's true in this world is of God. It's of his energies. It's, it's of his gifts. It's of his grace. And although what's beautiful, good, and true, God's energies happens in the world. You know, God in his essence is beyond the world, but his energies are not at all different or not distinct from his essence that is beyond time and space. But anyway, that's, uh, I, I, that's, so, so then that was the presence of God. And then, When we, any time we, we can think about and accept, recognize God's presence in our life, every time that's God calling us, calling to us, announcing himself to us, making himself known through his word, calling, beckoning us into him, into his love, into his presence, into his hands. And God always comes to us in such moments, whether you're five or whether you're 25 or whether you're 85, or whether you're five seconds old. God always comes to us in a way that we can handle, because again, we're talking about his essence beyond time and space being made available to us in our conditions of time and space and within our frailties as being creatures. He, he makes himself known to us in a way that we can receive, but not necessarily understand in the moment or even understand for many years. And so I was about 35 when Father Fraser asked me about my first experience of God and it was remembering something that had happened 30 years prior. It took me 30 years and with the help of a spiritual director, a priest, to be able to see how the spirit was working in me and for me 30 years prior. It's really important for us to be able to think about our lives and to look back in our lives, maybe as far back as when we were five-year-old boy or girl, and ask ourselves the question, what's the earliest experience or memory that we have of something really, really beautiful or really, really good or really, really true? Ask yourself that. Get, find a quiet place where you can, might be undisturbed so you can meditate on your earliest memory of that which is really beautiful, really good, or really true. Memorably good, beautiful, or true. Maybe something that's stuck with you for many years. And start to think about the fact, and I use that word intentionally, the fact that that was God, and that is God calling you.
The next questions I had before I say a little bit more about the daily office came from Brian Rafado. Um, he was asking me to say a little bit about the words Catholic and apostolic. And I presume that that question came because we say those words twice a day. Well, actually, not exactly. We say Catholic once a day, and then on Sundays we say Catholic and Apostolic in the Nicene Creed. I believe in one, or I believe one holy Catholic and Apostolic Church. And by the way, just did you notice that when we moved from right two to right one a year and a half ago, I guess it was? that the creed, you know, I'm sure you noticed that the creed changed. But it, it even changed in a way that you might not have quite noticed. And the creed changed, I'm just finding it right now. I can never find things when I want to find things. Oh, okay. So if you'd like to look on your, in your book, it's on page 328. The, la the, the last I believe is, I believe one holy Catholic and apostolic church. The right two version of that, which is I believe 350 something, 358, I was, I was closer this time. Whereas the right one version says, I believe one holy Catholic and apostolic church. The right two translation is, I believe, or we believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Believe in, in right two, and just believe in right one, the older creed translation. So let's just talk about the, that part of the older translation. I believe one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Well, those four words, one, holy, Catholic, apostolic, are known as the four notes of the church, four qualities, or you know, people who, who, who drink wine and love drinking wine will talk about how this or that wine has certain notes of flavor characteristics or hues in a painting or, you know, uh, textures. Um, the four notes or characteristics of the church, one holy, Catholic, and apostolic. It's worth talking about briefly the other two notes besides the two that uh, Brian asked me about Catholic and Apostolic. One means there is only one church. There are not many churches. We need to remember this more. There's only one church, no matter what tradition we're in. We're in the Episcopal Church. We like to sometimes talk about that as our church. No, it's not. The Episcopal Church is Really, it's better understood as a tradition. We have a tradition, um, and that's the Episcopal Church, which is a part of a larger, more encompassing tradition, which is the Anglican tradition, which is part of a larger, more encompassing tradition that's called the Latin or Western Church, of which the Roman Catholic Church is a part of also. Um, it's not that it, before the Anglican Church that it was necessarily Roman Catholic. That's a complicated bit of history there. All I'm saying is that the larger, you know, Episcopal Church, Anglican tradition, and then Western Latin tradition, of which the Roman Catholic Church is also a part. And then finally, the church which includes both the Western Latin tradition and the Eastern Greek and Syrian traditions. And there's a lot of traditions in this one church, but it is one. Well, there is only one. And furthermore, that one church has three states of being. 
thought about that. So it's sometimes called, this is referred to by the term, the threefold church. Not the threefold regula, the threefold church. What are the threefolds or states of the church? The church militant, that's the church visible on the earth right now, you know, human beings who are alive in their, in, in their mortal life. That's so the church militant. Then the church expectant is the next state. And that's where our faithful departed, the souls of the faithful departed exist. It's a state of being. We're, the church militant is a state of being. The church expectant is a different state of being, still alive. That's why we pray for the faithful departed and ask their prayers for us. It's still a relationship. In, a, in the funeral liturgy, of, in our Book of Common Prayer, we talk about how our relationship with the dead, upon their death, I mean, is not ended but changed. They're still alive in the church expectant, in, the, in that way of being. It's also sometimes called the intermediate state. It's also sometimes called purgatory. It all means the same thing. Finally, the church triumphant or proper heaven. And this is where triune God and all of the angels, the holy angels, as well as the saints are. Okay? The church triumphant or heaven. So the one church is three states. Holy. That is to say, embodied by God's presence. Holiness. When a place feels holy, Grand Canyon, um, a beautiful park, a beautiful church, um, a gravesite, um, anywhere where there's a beautiful flower, um, you name it. Anything that you would identify as a place, a sacred spot or sacred place that feels, has a sense of holiness or a sense of sacred, it has that presence because God is there. And God's presence is also named as his holiness. And it's a holy in, in the notes of the church refers to his presence, which is available to us. That's what holy means. God is actively present. It, the church, in other words, has God's active presence. It's one and it's holy. Catholic. The word Catholic is capitalized in our creed. Um, and it refers to um, complete, not missing anything, full, and, in, and thereby whole. The word Catholic also means, it's actually, it literally means, if you look in the etymology, Catholic comes from kata, kata holos, according to the whole. Kata according, holos, whole. Okay, so one holy Catholic, full, not missing anything, complete unto itself. And finally, apostolic. Apostolic means that the church that proclaims the resurrection of Christ cru crucified through the apostles. Apostolic. Christ's resurrected glorious body was seen by the apostles in, 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 this, in John's gospel as well as in the other gospels uh, well not not so much Mark a little bit but in Luke's gospel particularly is the classic moment where Jesus on the first day of Easter the, or the first Easter day walks with two disciples along the road to Emmaus. They don't recognize him. They see this guy. They, they think he's a stranger. Luke tells us that it's Jesus resurrected, walking with them. Uh, in John's gospel, Mary Magdalene at the empty tomb earlier that morning, 
sees a man she thinks is a gardener, she learns it's Jesus after she hears him call her by her name. Okay, so Mary Magdalene is an apostle. Um, and you, all of the members of the upper room church, the 120 of them, as I said yesterday, are apostles. They were sent to the room. The word apostle means someone who is sent. They were sent to the room to, to wait for the promise of the Father, which was the coming of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost came, and they were sent out into the world by the Holy Ghost. So Jesus is known through the proclamations of the apostles, those that are written down um, and what comprise our collection of New Testament books, writings. Those are all writings of the apostles. So it, it, our church is the only church that we care about is that which is proclaimed by the apostles, apostolic. See, so one holy Catholic apostolic. And note, as a final point about the words Catholic and apostolic, that when we say that in those words in the creed, or when we say Catholic in the, in the Apostles' Creed, we are talking about those meanings. We're not, these have nothing to do with denominations. You know, when we say Catholic, we're not like talking about the Roman Catholic Church. When we say apostolic, we're not talking about the apostolic Christian Church. It has nothing to do with uh, what we're saying. So if that's helpful, let me know. And if that leads to more questions, Brian and Frank, let me know. Okay, let me quick look at the time. I want to try to be good. Ha <laughs> ha. All right. Well, it's half an hour in. And five more minutes. I said 30 to 40, so five, maybe 10 more minutes. Okay. I wanted to, mostly what I'll say is just by way of review of yesterday, so you can keep it in your mind, because I want you to keep savoring and thinking about this image of uh, the daily offices and the threefold regula of office, mass, and personal devotion as totally wrapped up in the activity of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. Okay, totally wrapped up in it and of it. It's kind of like the threefold regula of daily offices and Eucharistic masses and our life of personal devotion or what it says in Acts chapter 2, verse 42. The apostles' teaching and fellowship, that's personal devotion. The breaking of the bread, that's the mass. And the prayers, that's the daily offices, as well as all of the other prayerfulness that we have, that uh, Christians have. Um, those three, you know, the threefold regula or rule, those, the threefold regula is so of the presence of the Holy Spirit. It is, it is inseparable from it. We you could no more separate the, the threefold regular from the presence of the Holy Spirit than you could separate a home run from the baseball game. I mean, you, you know, you, you stand on a baseball field right now, although I guess I don't even know if the police would let us do that right now. If we, you're not supposed to be in our shelter in place, but say we snuck, one of us right now went and snuck on a baseball field. So down here in Pekin at Coke Field, Go over there and, you know, maybe bring a, a tee and a ball and a bat and maybe a bunch of balls. In my case, I probably would need like 100 balls and swing and try to hit a ball over the fence. Okay. You know, we could hit a ball over the fence, you know, with nobody else around or even during a practice of a baseball game. But it, it's not a home run. It's just hitting the ball over the fence. A home run only happens in the game. Christian Yelich hits a lot of home runs, by the way. So the threefold regula only happens within the game, which within the presence of the Holy Spirit. And that's in, so that's 
scriptural, you know, verse 42 is in the chapter when the coming of the Holy Spirit, Pentecost. So it's in that in scripture, but it's also in that in our religious life now. So right now, we are doing personal devotion. Okay? We are, we're, we're devoting ourselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship. We're in fellowship right now. We're having a kind of class. It's fellowship. It's a form of fellowship. There's different kinds of fellowship. This is one. We're thinking about the, ap the apostolic teaching, particularly the teaching of uh, Luke, the evangelist. And so we're, we're thinking about his teaching, apostolic teaching. And, you know, uh, on, in the second chapter of Acts, which I hope you read yesterday, along with the first chapter, this is on the heels of St. Peter's preaching, another apostle. Um, so we're doing, we're doing apostles teaching and fellowship right now. Anytime we have a class, anytime you, you yourself read the scriptures, and you know, do so in terms of uh, trying to be prayerful. Um, anytime you you read anything of, of devotional nature, or anytime you consciously act in the world in, in to or for Christ. In other words, like if you're walking around the world and you know that the person you bump that bumps into you, or that you bump into at the grocery store, or at the baseball game, or at the football game, or along the street, walking your dog, that if you know that that person is filled with Christ, you're having a moment of personal devotion. Even if you just say, hey, nice day outside today, isn't it? Because it's Christ talking to Christ. You, a member of the body of Christ, talking to another person who might be baptized or might not be baptized, but in either case is made in the image of Christ. Christ talking to Christ. It's a moment of personal devotion. So everything from studying and praying and reading and uh, doing, uh, you know, anything sort of informal to being in the world, being uh, a good neighbor, being a good citizen, uh, to, you know, not flipping off the person who, is, who cuts you off with their grocery card in the grocery store. All of that is a form of personal devotion, okay? I mean, some of it is more intense than others, obviously. So it's important for us to know that, that the Holy Spirit is present in, in, in all of that. Really present. And this may not, it may not feel like the Holy Spirit is present, but here's a moment where it's important to know that any time Anything of the threefold regula is happening, whether it's office, whether it's mass, whether it's personal devotion and the infinite variety that personal devotion can happen. Any time that those, any of those things in those categories are happening, the Holy Spirit is actively present. In fact, it's the Holy Spirit that's brought you here to click on to the live stream that's on our parish website or on Facebook Live or on Twitter or on YouTube. It's the Holy Spirit that's empowered your doing so. You could have chosen not to. You could have known that Father Dolman was doing a broadcast at 3 p.m. Eh. But no, you chose to be here. That's the Holy Spirit acting through you. And the Holy Spirit also is present when we pray morning prayer and evening prayer. You need to know that, even if it doesn't feel that way. And it often won't, as I said yesterday. But it, know that anything that's of the threefold regula is empowered and lifted up by the Holy Spirit's presence. And there are prayers in, the, in morning prayer and evening prayer that reflect that. And when we come across those, I'll, I'll point those out. So the, the prayer of St. Chrysostom, for example, at the end of evening prayer is a good example. And then, of course, the Mass, the breaking of the bread, the other part of the threefold regula. That you, maybe that's not as hard to see as an activity that's held up and empowered by the Holy Spirit, but know that it is just as much as the other, the other two. The threefold regula is an is the Holy Spirit working through us. 
when we are caught up into praying the daily office, praying mass, or engaging in any sort of devotional activity, any activity of personal prayer, it's the Holy Spirit that's making it happen through you, present to you. You need to know that. Okay, that's that's enough for today. Um, we're gonna we're gonna break here, but before we do, a reminder that evening prayer is at five p.m. and we'll do the uh, Eve of the Annunciation to Blessed Mary, but also involves a different collect than the fourth Sunday in Lent. And then tomorrow we will have is the is, well actually the feast of the Annunciations begins at even song. So it begins tonight and then it carries on into tomorrow. So Matins tomorrow at 8.30 will be in commemoration of the Annunciation. Mass, of course, will be at noon. Uh, Mass for the Annunciation. I will uh, deliver a brief homily that will be broadcast live at 3 p.m. tomorrow about the Feast of the Annunciation. And then uh, evening prayer tomorrow, uh, also for the Feast of the Annunciation. Okay, see you in a bit. Blessings, brothers and sisters.